Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chase Oaks Church. We are so glad that you have joined us this weekend. We are continuing a series called Grown Up Faith. And the reason we are doing this series is, well, you know, what can happen for a lot of us is we can grow up a certain way, learning some things about God. And sometimes you, 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 what comes, comes along with growing up is we, we have this faith that we were taught as kids, and then all of a sudden you experience some heartbreak and some disappointments, and, and life happens. And it can make you well, question what you, what you believe. And, and, and sometimes you can even grow up in a specific denomination where you say, hey, here's a certain box. We want everyone to fit inside this box. And, and you, 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 know, you, you walk the company line, so to speak, for a little bit, but then one day you just start to think, I don't know if I fit in that box. I, I don't know if my life fits in that box. Dare I say, I'm not sure if my faith fits in this box anymore. D- does God fit in the box? Can God be put in a box? And so you, you can kind of start thinking outside the box, and all of a sudden you can just kind of feel like, well, maybe I'm not sure that, that my faith fits with, with what, what I've been taught my whole life. And so what we're doing in this series is really trying to Help us understand why we believe what we believe and and the reason that we're stepping into, you know, a relationship with God. And and what does that what does that really look like for for you? uh, It could be your first time in church. Maybe somebody sent this message to you and and you kind of look around the world. Think to yourself, there's a lot of chaos. (laughs) Gas prices are high. (laughs) There's there's wars going on. There's division. And man, couldn't an almighty God. Well, do something about all of this. Uh, Maybe for you, uh, you walked away from church for a while, and maybe this is your first time coming back since a a pandemic. If you're here today, welcome back. It's good to see you. We've missed you. You might be here trying to figure out, okay, are we fist bumping, elbowing, hugging? Like, you may not know what the, what's kosher. Uh, Again, getting back into the swing of things at church. Don't worry, we're all in this thing together. And as we are sort of putting together the building blocks for what our faith should be all about, uh, today I, I want to talk to you about how to build your life. Because every single person, what they do is, is uh, they have a, a method, a rubric, a, a way in which they decide, hey, this is how I want to build my life. Uh, dare I say a plan for your life. There is this idea that they're going to say, okay, here's how I'm going to move towards something in my life. And most people build their life around their dreams. They build their life around saying, okay, here's, here's, the, here's the thing that I, I think would, would be really, really great. Perhaps it's the American dream. I found that most people can build their life around a couple of questions. Um, the first question is, well, what do we want to do? What do we want to do? For a lot of us, this has been the guiding question that has literally helped us move towards a, a direction in our life to say, man, what, what do we, we want to do? Our life is really about us. And, and this, isn't, this isn't a terrible thing. Some people wake up and say, man, I, I want to be a doctor. So they're going to go to school and they, guess what? They're going to they're gonna be a doctor. Some people say, hey, I want to be a lawyer. They're going to they're gonna do everything in their life and say, hey, I'm going to move towards, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go study the law. I'm going to be a lawyer. Some people say, I want to be a professional athlete. And so they spend a great deal of their, of their life trying to, to progress in, in the area of sports. Some people say, hey, I want to be an educator. Some people say, I, uh, I, I want to be a pastor. Like everyone can kind of have these, these desires. You can say, hey, I, I want to get married. You can say, hey, I want to have kids. Not just, not just regular kids. You get, the kids got to be athletic. They got to be smart. They got to be kind. They got to play four sports. I mean, like there's, there's some things and they got to have a, a really good GPA and go to a really great college. And so these are the things that, well, well, what are they? These are the things we want. And, and that can be this, this, this guiding light for us. It's moving our life forward. But then there's another question that, that can really consume us. And that question is, what do others want us to do? What do others want us to do? Some, some of us don't, don't even know how we got in the room because we've been following somebody else for a very, very long time. I remember reading the story about Andre Agassi. Andre Agassi, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. In his memoir, Open, in 2009, it came out, shocked the sports world. What we discovered in his book was that one of the greatest tennis players of all time 
doesn't like tennis. <laughs> It blew us away. We, we, if, if you follow the story, it just, it just, it was mind blowing. It was like, what do you mean you don't like tennis? Here's what we discovered. Andre didn't like tennis. His dad liked tennis. And his dad forced him to like tennis. And now that he's retired, he can actually just be Andre. Isn't it amazing that you can wake up living out somebody else's dream? Some of us find ourselves in positions where we took a job that other people wanted us to take. We could drive a car that other people want us to drive. We could live in a neighborhood that other people want us to live in. We can actually date people that other people go, man, this, this person is great. Some people actually will marry somebody that man, our family, our, my family loves them. Do you? You can find yourself in this position letting other people guide your life. I know some people whose whole entire lives is guided by social media. It's an industry I love, but it is an industry whose economy is literally predicated off of what is not actual reality. <laughs> Photoshopped photos and filtered videos that makes our lives look better. Yet, it can literally guide an entire generation in which the direction of their life of going, okay, this is, and every single one of us has to have something fundamental that is literally guiding us. And for some of us, other people and what they want is what is steering the direction of our life. Dare I say, the direction of our, of our faith. But here's a question that I think could change your life. If you let it, what does God want us to do? I mean, you see it on the screen, and maybe for you, you, you don't remember the last time you paused to ask this question. What does God want me to do? There can be this conflict between what we want, what others want for us, and what God actually wants for us. You know, Ephesians 2 verse 10 says this. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let me ask you this. Do you know your Ephesians 2.10? Do you know the thing that God created for you to do in advance, long before you were born, God started crafting a plan for your life? And I would hate for anybody to miss their Ephesians 2.10. Do you know what yours is? How are you building your life Is it around your dreams or is it around what other people want for you or is it around what what God wants for you? I want to give you three things, three things that are going to help you build your life around. And I believe if, if you will make a decision to build your life around these three things, you'll have life like you've never had it before. The, the first thing that I think is vitally important if you're going to build a life is to build a life around God's will. Build your life around God's will. It's interesting when, uh, when you start thinking about dreams and you start studying it from a biblical standpoint, dreams in Scripture, they're not really a good thing, okay? Most of the time, dreams in Scripture... Uh, it's usually a warning to someone that is about to die, okay? Like, like these dreams are not like, like they, were, they, were, they were horrible, like warnings, like, hey, a flood's coming. Like, I mean, like, they're, like it, was, it was not very good things. Like, like if you go to Scripture and you look for somebody's dreams coming true, you, you find like maybe two stories. And one of them is Joseph. And he had to go through a lot before he ever even saw his dream come true. I'm not even sure he wanted it. Like, he has a dream, and he's in charge of his brothers. He's like, I don't really like my brothers that much. How did they get in my dream? I'm not sure. But if you just think about the main characters of Scripture, name one that you would say, yep, living the dream. Like, not many. Moses, you, would you want to lead two, three million people across the Red Sea that are just going to be complaining for 40 years? You don't want Moses' job, okay? This is not a luxurious job whatsoever. Even Moses is like, get me out of here. Take me up already. Beam me up, Scotty, yesterday. He doesn't want to be there. You, you think about David. You're like, man, he's living a dream. He's, he's, he's a fugitive 
For, for, for a good portion of his life, he's running from Saul. He's not living the dream. You think about Daniel. He's in a lion's den. It's a great story now, but it wasn't a great story in the moment. In the moment, you're like, I'm about to die. Like, this is not good. Like, no one here dreams. Like, hey, you know what? I think I like to stay with some lions tonight. No, you don't. Like, that, that's not, that, that's certainly not the dream. Jonah, anybody, any takers that are going, man, living the dream, would love to get swallowed by a big fish, a whale. Like, they, like, 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 like nobody wants that. Solomon. Man, my homie had 700 wives, like another sermon for another day, but that's not a dream. I don't know anybody's like, I want 700, like 700, that's a lot, okay? We'll get to that in another series at some point, I'm sure. The Apostle Paul, who's probably the most responsible for guiding the global church today, wrote how many letters from prison? He, these Peter who was crucified upside down, John the Baptist who was beheaded, Jesus Christ who was crucified. These, you start thinking about living the dream, chase your dreams, pursue your dreams. I, guys, I'm, I'm having a hard time making a, a biblical case for it because when you look at the main characters in the movie that definitely is the scriptures what you find is a bunch of people who that just simply surrendered to God's plan for their life and they were more fulfilled doing what God wanted them to do than they were doing their own thing in fact if you want to build your life don't spend it pursuing a dream spend it pursuing God's will for your life Matthew 6, verses 9 through 10, it says, This then is how you should pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes, if you have a, a bedrock for your life, a rubric, a philosophy that is moving your life forward, especially when you start to engage in your faith. What can happen for you and what can happen for me is we can begin to make our faith about our name. We can begin to make our faith about our little kingdom, our little neighborhood, everything that's going on in our home. We can begin to actually make our faith about our will. But what I love about what Jesus is doing here is, 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 is he's going, actually, this is all about your name. This is all about your kingdom. This is all about your will. If we could take a fine-tooth comb through all of our prayers from the last 10 years, how what percentage of our prayers have been trying to get God to perform our will? To make our name great? To give me a promotion praying for things that will serve what? Me. But when we go to God, it, it's not for him to, to make something happen for us. We're not trying to get God to, to, to bend to our will. We're actually going to God so that we can bend ours to his we're, we're, we're going to God to, to, to say, hey, here, here, here's my life. In fact, we're going to God to say, hey, here's what I want to do. And God, you can see what I want to do. And I'm actually going to lay that down for what you want for my life. That, that's, that's what Jesus did so well. He, he, he's going, I just, I, I want to do, do your will. And, and here's, what, here's what I believe to be true. I think most Christians want that too. I, I, I've yet to meet the Christian who says, I actually want to live outside of God's will. I don't think people talk like that. I don't think people think that way. I, I just think sometimes it's so elusive, it's, it's very difficult for them to actually get a handle on it. Because it's, it's like, well, well, how do I actually know if it's God's will? I think that there are moments where God's will is based off of specific instructions. 
Go right, go left, move into this neighborhood, take this job, marry this person, go to, go to this school. Sometimes it's very specific. And sometimes God shows you that in mysterious ways. Sometimes it's through a conversation. I've yet to meet the talking donkey person yet, but nevertheless, you know, burning bush people, I don't know anybody in my life that they've heard that audible voice like, hey, you need to go this direction. But sometimes there's some clear directions. God will make himself known to you in some way, shape, or form on something very, very specific. But sometimes... God's will is based off of godly principles. Get in a small group. Now, I don't care which one. And you just need to be around any type of believers that are better than the people you used to hang out with that were really not adding any value to your life at all. Any, any small group, you're like, no, I want to be in the cool small group. No, any small group will do. You're like, no, 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 God wants me in their small group. No, nah, actually, maybe God just wants you in any small group and surrounded by a group of believers that can help you grow your faith. Uh, I mean, some people, they, they might say, man, uh, well, well, should I live in this neighborhood or this neighborhood? No, maybe you just, you just love your neighbor. And, and it could be your condo neighbor, your apartment neighbor, your Airbnb neighbor, your college dorm neighbor. Listen, if they're next to you, they are a candidate for the love of Jesus. Like, just pick the neighbor. You're just like, well, I don't know about this neighborhood. Like, I don't know if you're supposed to go to that neighborhood either, but I do know that whatever neighborhood you do live in, be a Jesus lover there. You're like, well, I don't know, man. I don't know square footage. It was built in 2010. I don't, I don't, I don't know. The last owners, man, they might have some foundation issues. But yeah, that, that's, that's a decent rubric, but are you going to love the neighbors wherever you do live? I mean, we're living a life off of godly principles. People are trying to figure out, well, what, what job should, should I have? Should I do this one? Should I take this position? How about this? Whatever job you do have, do it as unto the Lord. So may, maybe you got your dream job. That's great if you do, but just in case you don't, well, listen, whether you're at Walmart, Uber, McDonald's, Chipotle, T-Mobile, Panera, Grimaldi's, the mall, Foot Locker, maybe you work for the Dallas Cowboys, holla at your boy, like wherever, wherever you are on, on the spectrum, just pretend your boss is Jesus. That's the goal. Just say, man, my boss is Jesus. Like, this is who I work for. This is who I'm going to give my best energy to regardless. And I'm just going to work as unto the Lord. Is this the job God wants me to have? It's the job you do have. So walk in his will right where you are. I know some people are trying to figure out if, if, if they married the one. Chances are... You didn't marry a perfect person, but flawed ones are our only options. I wish we had other, I wish that there was like this website where we could find perfectpeople.com and we could pick from them. I don't know why they're going to want us, but nevertheless, it'd be great for us if we had all these perfect people. And so you can be sitting there thinking like, man, I don't, I don't know. Like, are they the ones? They're the one you got. That's, that's what I know. Did God tell you through a donkey to marry them? I'm doubtful. But do they love Jesus? Are they capable of fulfilling the vows you made before God and the people that you love? Well, then, hey, why don't you give your best there? I, I, I think that's how you can, can walk in God's will. I love what Proverbs 16, verse 3 says. It says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. You know what my favorite word in there is? Whatever. Whatever. It's like, man, what should I commit to the Lord? Whatever you do. Well, well, well you mean like whatever? I mean like, yeah, it says whatever. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with what it says. It says, it says whatever. I mean, maybe you're the type of person, and I'm not trying to knock you. Maybe you pray about where, you, where you're going to eat, okay, uh, eat today. You're like, oh, man, should we, should we go to IHOP, Cheesecake Factory? I don't know. What, what, what are we going to do? Lord, would you speak to us? And maybe, maybe God gives you a sign, and a piece of cheese just falls down. You're like, oh, Cheesecake Factory, let's go. Like, you just figured it out. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's your relationship with God, which is fine. I don't know if God's going to tell you which restaurant to go to. But my hope and prayer is that wherever you eat, that waiter, that waitress, 
would experience the kindest, most generous person they've met all week long. Wherever you are committed to the Lord. I love what 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, and I think this really simplifies the will of God a little bit, and this is going to frustrate some people, but it, 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 just, it just says it right here. It says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. Winning, losing, healthy, fighting an illness, dream job, regular job, big house, little house. God's will for each and every one of us is to just say, you know what? I'm going to give thanks in all circumstances. You're like, Ryan, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I don't know if I should go to this school. I don't know if I should date this girl. I don't know if I should take this job. Uh, Why don't you just be grateful for the position you're in right now? You should give thanks that you have options at all. You should give thanks that you're employed at all. Like, like what, what is God's will for everybody's life right now? To give thanks. In all circumstances, not on Thanksgiving. We're not talking about a holiday celebration. No, we're talking about a life. This is what you should build your life around to say, you know what? I want to build my life around God's will. And at any point in my day, if I can't give thanks to God in all circumstances, not good circumstances, key word here is is all. The second thing that I think is important for us to build our life around is build our life around God's people. Build our life around God's people. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I think one of the challenges coming out of a pandemic is the amount of isolation that we've experienced um, as, as a people. And as a church, we encourage people to be a part of a team be in a small group. And that's been pretty difficult for the past couple of years for everyone collectively to find themselves in a group of people that are life-giving, to find themselves in a group of people who are willing to pray for you and pray for your business and pray for your relationships and pray for your kids. And that when you have cares and you have anxieties, that you got somebody in your corner that's willing to say, hey, I got you. I know you've got some some plans in your life, but hey, we're, we're going we're to cover those things in prayer. We're going to help you submit your life to God. I know a lot of people, they're making a lot of plans in their life, except they're surrounded by all the wrong people. And then they're shocked when things go bad. And God's just going, hey, I'm not mad at you. I'm not judging you, but I, I really want you to commit, your, commit whatever you do my way because I, 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 I want to help you. And I know you think your friends are awesome, and they are, but they're terrible gods. And there's nothing that they can do. But trust me, you, your best bet is with me. And so I, I, to have people that are pointing you in that direction, I, I just think it, it is vitally important. I wouldn't be where I'm at today without some godly men and women that God has put in my life for the long haul. I think of a good friend of mine named Jeremy DeWert, who uh, was uh, my youth pastor. <laughs> he's my youth pastor, and now uh, he's, he's a really, really close friend. And I just think about his consistency over the course of my life. And I, I consider myself lucky to have multiple friends who have been men of God in my life for over 20 years. That I have 20-year faith-filled friends I consider myself extremely wealthy for that reason alone. That there are people that have been in my life that long that have been pointing me in the right direction to say, hey, Ryan, you are not on this planet to get what you want and for you to just go after your dreams. You are put on this planet to give glory to God. And on that journey, hey, there might be some fun stops. But your life is not about you. You want to build your life around God's people. Lastly, you want to build a life around God's word. You want to build a life around God's word. Matthew 7, verse 24 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down. The streams rose. 
and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. What I love about the words of Jesus is he wants to make sure that each and every one of us knows, hey, in life, the wind's going to blow. The waves are going to crash. There are going to be storms in life. Some people will make you believe that if you're following Jesus, you shouldn't have any storms. But following Jesus simply means you will have an anchor for your soul in a storm. So this isn't this idea of we shouldn't have storms. Jesus is going, no, storms are coming. But you got to build your house the right way so that your, your house can withstand the storm. And Jesus is going, hey, if you really want your house to stand, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, listen to my word and put it into practice. Like, whatever it is that you read on the page, figure out a way to copy and paste that into your life. And, and I, I've been reading the Bible pretty much my whole life. I remember getting a children's Bible at like six years old, and I was like, I got to read the whole thing. I was like one of those Bible nerds, okay? And, and here we are 30 years later, and we're still a little bit of a nerd when it comes to the Bible. And I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes reading the Bible will stress you out because you realize real quick, I ain't always doing what it says. I mean, I, people ask me all the time, like, man, Ryan, tell, tell me, give me your reading list, man. What, what, what books you been reading lately? I'm like, Matthew's kicking my tail right now, man. I'm telling you right now, dude, don't go to Mark, Luke, or John. Man, it's hurting me right now because there's some things that are just in red that I just can't ignore. I was talking to my wife the other day. We were just reading the scripture, and, just, and Jesus is going, hey, uh, you saw me naked. You saw me there on the side of the road, and you did nothing. You didn't come visit me in prison. And I, I, just, I just looked at my wife. I said, babe, we, we don't do this. We don't do this. In, in, in fact, we live in North Dallas. There's not that many people on the side of the road, if, if ever. And I, and I got to be honest with you, I have some family in town over the Christmas holidays. And so we order all this food. And, and you know, as a host, you always want to order more than enough food. And so we all eat, our bellies are full. And then at the end of it, what do we start doing? We start putting it in the trash. And, and my niece who lives in D.C., she's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? We're throwing away food? I went, yeah, I'm an American. That's what we do. You know, it's like. And she's like, well, why don't we give it to the homeless? And I just smiled. I said, sweetie, we're in North Dallas. We're not bougie. It's just, you know, I don't know where they're going to be on Christmas Eve, you know? And, and I was like, they're, they're just not here, sweetie. And she goes, yeah, there are. I saw them near the hotel. And I was convicted in that moment. And when I started driving after that moment, I started to see more people on the side of the road with signs that were hungry in North Dallas. I didn't see them because I wasn't looking for them. I assumed they're downtown when they're actually in mine. And I remember... I remember being in college and, and, and I heard this young adults pastor, he was talking about the gap between our faith and our actions. The gap between our faith and our works and the tension that we have there because we all believe that we should help the homeless but we have this, this Western idea that we can't give to the homeless because if we give to them, we're going to feed an addiction and if we give to them, they're just gonna go get more alcohol, they're gonna go get more drugs and so we have this thing, we see them and then we just go, okay, okay, okay. Cool. And he said, hey, so today uh, we're, we're, we just want to help solve that problem because I know you want to do right, but, you, but you've got this thing that's keeping you from doing it. You've got a great belief system. You just don't have a great action plan. So they bought gift cards as a church. They brought like $10,000 worth of gift cards, and they just said, hey, what we want you to do is we got a bunch of Subway gift cards and a bunch of McDonald's gift cards, and so you're going to come up here and give us money. We're going to give you the gift cards, and this is what we want you to do. We want you to stay kingdom ready wherever you go. 
So if you see someone on the side of the road, somebody stops you and, they, and they, they've got a sign, you're ready. You're not, you're not having this theological debate on whether or not you should or shouldn't do it. It's just like you're, you're ready. And, and as I was driving around more and more where we live in North Dallas, I'm going, Ryan, when did you stop being kingdom ready? And so we, we ordered a bunch of Subway gift cards. So if you're on the side of the road, you're going to get a, get a foot long from the leaks, okay? So and we, just, we, just keep them, we just keep them in our, in our middle compartment, in our vehicles. And I just say, hey, babe, if you see somebody, it's not about cash. It's not about a whole... It, it, we're just trying to be kingdom ready. I'm not telling you to go get gift cards. What I am telling you is nothing is not an option. Like, like we don't just get to go, oh, well, well, you know, we'll be all right. You know, well, we gave to the church. We didn't. Nothing is not an option. Uh, I, I'm just so fascinated by what Chase Oaks does in the community and in the Good Center. So many opportunities for us to do something instead of just rational. I'm not reading. I, I, sometimes I read scripture and I rationalize scripture. But lately I've just been reading it and just going, why don't you do something about it? James says true religion is to take care of widows and orphans. And sometimes you can just live life and think, I don't know any widows or I don't know any orphans. And, and every now and then you got to question that and ask yourself, are you sure you don't? We talk about how many people have lost loved ones over the past couple of years. Are you sure you don't know any widows? Are you sure that you don't know any foster parents and foster homes that you could support or be of aid to? Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, don't, I don't know how to just read the Bible and stay normal. I, I, I don't get how you can do that. If you're building your faith from the ground up, you're going to have a grown-up faith, and, and you want to have something that lasts. You want something that, that someone can't come and destroy. It. Jesus is going, hey, listen to what I say and just put it in the... Put it into practice. Is there, sometimes when I read it in red, I just go, well, God, that's, that's going to make me a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, it's probably not as bad as a cross. So you had to go to the ATM. Poor you. Your time got a little bit of inconvenience. You have been crucified upside down. Our worst day is a vacation for the Apostle Paul. And so sometimes I'm looking at my faith and trying to make it grown up. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like, man, you're supposed to be teaching people this stuff. I go, yeah, but I got to be living this stuff. I'm not just a guy that puts together great, great talks. It's living and active, we, we, we approach the scripture and we, we say, God, I want to build my life around this. These are the principles in which I, I live my life. And, and, and here's the deal. I, maybe God says go right. Maybe God says go left. Or, or, or maybe the way Jesus said, he goes, when you saw him, you saw me. You saw a guy or a woman or family standing on the corner. It, it, you, you saw me. And so treat them like you would treat the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's we might get him a little bit more in Subway. If you start thinking about it, like, you get a little crazy. But I just, my prayer for us is that as we are continuing to build our faith, that it would turn into action. I love studying God's word professionally. I love studying God's word on a personal level. But it can't just remain cerebral. At some point, it's got to be living and active. That's my prayer for us today. God, I thank you so much for Chase Oaks Church. God, I pray that uh, we would build our life around your will. That our, our dreams would be your dreams. God, I pray that we would engage in the group of people you've put in our life, that we would be surrounded by uh, amazing people that could help us grow closer to you. And God, I pray that our life would be centered around your word. Let it challenge us. May, may we be people that when we read what we, what we read, that we wouldn't ignore it, we wouldn't rationalize it, that, that it would convict us to do something because nothing is not an option. Help us to build our life on the rock. In Jesus' name we pray.
Everybody said, amen. amen.